Hey there! Uh, Skullheads, I'm Snags. And I'm old Silky! And I'm Alan. And tonight we're going to be talking about the second best band in the world right after Motorhead, the Beatles. Um, but first, old Silky's going to pimp the website. Yeah, uh, go on uh, snagsandsilky.com. Uh, there's a playlist for tonight's episode that is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, covers the Beatles um, from 58 to 64, part one. Um, but also go on and uh, click on the merch, uh, get a mug and a T-shirt, celebrate the 4th of July. Christmas is right around the corner. Um six months away but no time but the present to prepare um we got we got a new uh snags and silky maxi drive gas powered uh vibrator it's called the crotch destroyer x5000 get that just it cranks up like a chainsaw (laughs) so that's that's on the on the store now that's limited edition so if you go on and it's gone then you were too late yeah yeah so um you might wonder why are we doing uh an episode on the Beatles. And as, as you know, having chosen to listen to this episode, you saw the title, it said part one. So exactly how many episodes are we going to do on the Beatles? Well, we did three episodes on motorhead. And if you ask anybody who are the three greatest bands in the world, obviously they're going to say motorhead is first. The Beatles are second, then the stones. And then it just goes on down from there. Right? So we will do three stones episodes at some point, but, um, we did three Motorhead. We got to do three Beatles. It would just be disrespectful not to. And um, the other thing is the Beatles were Lemmy's favorite band. So obviously that's part of what makes them the number two best band in history. And um, we have with us tonight uh, Alan Bailey in the house. He's a Beatles expert, a mega Beatles nut, nuthead Beatles fan. He's also he's, he's regaling us with a, a lovely uh, yellow submarine backdrop, which yeah, uh, he's got a yellow submarine backdrop. Yeah, he's rocking. Spared no expense. It, it yeah. sets the tone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It, I've got a I've got a Bukowski poster and a Kiss poster behind me, which both of which are totally unrelated, except that we have to mention Kiss in every episode. So I got that out of the way. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, and um, I've got my Beatles wig on. There you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so he's got. He's yeah, he's What's got the uh, George Costanza. I was just going to say the George Costanza one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it it was eaten by moth, so it's you know, yeah. It's, it's There's shrinkage, but anyways. So um, uh, if you go back uh, to episode five of this podcast, way back when, we interviewed this cat named Stephen Gregory, and we were focusing on mainly on his band Uneven Stephen really good and you know funk funk rock type of stuff and uh with some jazz thrown in there um and in that episode steven mentions his other band wet shoelaces they've been together for like 25 years you can find them on Bandcamp. um you know you always got to throw out comparisons just to give people a general idea think ween frank zappa, zappa. yeah um and uh, that kind of stuff. And um, uh, I ran across these cats. God, what must have been like 2002 or something. Do you remember, Alan? Yeah, how- I think you're right. It was 01, 02, because yeah. I remember visiting you in 02. Um, yeah, the, we, there was some jazz yeah. festival at, at Piedmont Park, yeah, I think. Right, but I think you found us through the, if we were on something like uh, Garage Band or something at the time. Whenever, I was making, you know, in 2000, we started just to put our stuff wherever we could put it on GarageBand, whatever CD baby, yeah, whatever you know. The thing at the time was, and and I think it was everybody come again that you liked, right? Anyway, so well, I, I was I was basically making these short films right. at the time. I was going to be a big famous director, right? And we were um, going to ride your coattails. Yeah, they were going to get famous with me. They, I, I was going to become the, Tim Burton, and they were going to be the Danny. Yeah. Uh, what the fuck? Is, what's his Tim Burton soundtrack guy? Danny. Uh, Elfman. Not Danny Bonner, Elfman. Dude. Danny Elfman. 
yeah. they were going to be the Danny Elfman to my, uh, and anyways, um, yeah. um, uh, so I was making these short films and putting them in film festivals and, um, I started get, I, I found these cats on the internet. They had a, a completely weird, fucked up, twisted sense of humor, just like, just like me. And, um, just like Silky, actually Silky and I had made some stuff before that. And, um, and so, you know, I started getting them to do soundtracks for these short films and, you know, it went nowhere obviously cause now I'm doing a podcast and, you know, still driving to work every day. So, <laughs> but it was fun. Um, and, it was, uh, it was fun. That, yeah. that was the, that was probably El one Condor. Of, one of the top highlights of doing West Shoelaces. Mm -hmm. that, that's that. Nice. Already El Condor. Oh, nice. El Condor in the house. Yeah. Pimp right. the merch. Hey, boy, got, pimp, pimp that merch. We got mugs. We got anything you Sticker. name it. Stickers. Stickers. We got Beatles Pimp wigs. Pimp your mother. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Break it up. All right. Time for you to just tone it, tone it down and go to bed. All right. All right. No, it's fine. Hey, go ahead. I, we just started, and you get away, you kid. You bother me. Longer now that you've uh, okay. fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, El Condor. <laughs> All right. Did he say what I thought he said? I'm not sure. What Tell he your said mothers. That. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Um. Anyways. Um. So. Uh, so Alan, you know, since Stephen was on, he's been listening to the podcast and digs it, and I, we got an email from him out of the blue. I think we probably mentioned the Beatles on one of our episodes. Yeah. And and I was talking about I think we were talking about songwriting and the difference between crappy pop songwriting and just really good pop songwriting. Like you got the Beatles, you got early Paul Westerberg, you got a lot of these cats that can write really good fucking songs. And it's not the same as selling out like Van Hagar. So um after that episode, I guess because I was dropping the Beatles references, I get I get an email from uh, Alan. He's like, "Don't even think about doing a Beatles episode without me. I'm a Beatles maniac. I love and the this, Beatles." This has been in the works because I always kind of thought if you did a Beatles history, you would have to break it down to early, you know, fifty eight to sixty four. Yeah. Then in sixty five, it gets a little more. Um, um, you know, ethereal, um, experimental, you know, experimental yeah, start, starts yeah. getting experimental. Yeah. Right. You know, the, the, the lyrics matured, I would say, um, Dylan, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah, Dylan, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, plus, uh, that, that's when they started smoking the weed was right around, I think help and all that stuff. But, right. um, this so so basically you can consider this episode is the black and white years. This is back when the Beatles were in black and white. Right. And um I do want old Silky to tell the story about how his father explained to him why old movies like Hard Day's Night were in black oh, and white. Yeah. Tell that story. Uh, yeah, so uh way back in the day, um it could have been um it could have been the seeing uh a uh, hard day's night for the first time or you know any number of movies that were in black and white actually i think it was that first king kong movie to be honest with you seeing that on tv and asking my dad why things were black and white and color and he said that a, a, a meteor hit the earth where the grand canyon was and and after everything went to color and uh and i think i kind of hung on to that for a long time wow so yeah yeah so this is right before the color <laughs> meteor hit the before earth the meteor. And, the meteor okay yeah hard days yeah. nights in black and white and help is in color and there right. the, yeah, the yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um so yeah the, i would say the beatles are perhaps the most important band of all time right after um, motorhead before <laughs> the beatles before the beatles yet elvis and sinatra but Few bands had caused such a stir. Uh, most, if you think about who who the celebrities were, a lot of them were solo artists or one guy and his band. And so, you know, if you're a guitar player, your third guy on the left, um, 
there was not a lot of uh, money made for like a session guitar player. You, you had to be the guy out front that was pretty and had, had the, the wavy hair and, uh, and could sing, you know? Um, so I, I just, just without thinking too hard, it doesn't seem like there was anybody like that. There, there was actually briefly, the crickets were just called the crickets. Yeah. Okay. And then they eventually became Buddy Holly and the Crickets, but I'm I'm pretty sure the Beatles were probably aware of them when they were just the Crickets. I mean, the Beatles obviously they ripped their name off from the Crickets. Yeah. Paul McCartney owns yeah. Buddy Holly's song catalog, or he did for a while. Yeah. Um, some I'm, of those early Beatles songs, you can really hear the Crickets influence. So they, yeah, they, there's there's yeah. a definite like Everly Brothers. Yeah. Um, buddy holly the harmonizing but it did become it buddy holly and the crickets pretty quickly to your it point it just had not been done to that level mm -hmm. um with with what the beatles uh started and there are people we meet now that don't get it that i've i've literally had someone say oh i i don't like the beatles and i just have to i just have to pause and i think well you're an idiot <laughs> and any conversation about music after you just said that there's not a lot i can yeah. really i've lost interest now you know? no that's like having a terminal disease it's just it's yeah, over it's um, nothing can but, be done but you'll get that kid and i do say kid because at that point you're a, a fucking moron and and you know that's what kids well, do i i think it's just it has to be explained in terms of the universe. There has to be an anti Beatles, like a Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, you know, Captain Z Fart. Zappa you know, hated Zappa didn't you know, like the Beatles. Right. Yeah. I thought they were, yeah. His, yeah. His pedestrian. I, right. I, but again, without the Beatles, I just don't think, you know, the, the Beatles caused the entire, from, from the management to the record producers to, to the, the everyone had to uh reassemble and do things differently after the Beatles oh, absolutely. Was, yeah th there was you know uh the the first few singles um you know over a million uh pre-sale like they wanted this shit you know and and they couldn't fill the demand and th that had never happened so yeah. I, I again I think the Beatles caused the entire industry to recalibrate and um you didn't have that before so it, it bizarrely uh, they also they were really, the they were the prototype for the merch that bands like kiss really started to uh yeah and maximize. there was a guy there was a guy in 64 that went to them and said hey i want to i want to make a bunch of beatles stuff and brian epstein in the middle of juggling all these plates uh the guy says or he says you know here's a contract i want to i want to make uh beatles merch and uh and you get 10 percent of whatever i and and he usually it's the other way around uh right. the merch guy gets 10 percent, and the band retains 80 percent uh or something even more you know and this guy <laughs> just rolled the dice took the right chance now. And said, uh, "Yeah, I, uh, you get ten percent." And and there, yeah, okay. And and the paperwork came back, and it was signed. So he fucking ran with it. And you had everything: Beatle, Beatle radios, Beatle wigs, Beatle, and and this guy got ninety or eighty percent of the proceeds. Unbelievable, in, Brian! Inst yeah. Instant millionaire. I mean, yeah, Brian. You know, I mean, you know, was. You know, it was his first band, you know, that he was yeah. managing. He, was, you yeah. know, he made a lot of bad deals, as good as he was. He made well, and I'd say the, the Beatles weren't harmed at all by well, the, no, no, that no. mistake, but, but just wow, yeah, in and of itself. Like Paul McCartney's to the as of the mid 90s, he still get he was still getting 15 percent from the sales of yesterday. Dag, <laughs> yeah, that's uh. <clears throat> Thanks so to I want to go, <laughs> I wanna go back to July 6th, 1957. Yep. This would absolutely be a uh, time machine moment. 
Um, oh, God, yes. You go back to the St. Peter's Church Rose Queen Garden Fete in Walton, England, to see the quarrymen play. And John's uh, skiffle group, the quarrymen. Quarrymen. Um, they, uh, they were up there playing. Paul McCartney comes to this big festival, probably couple hundred people all milling around this this big uh, garden. Uh, really a scene out of the Yellow Submarine, if you think about it, in Pepperland, where they're all, you know, all the music <laughs> exactly. going and stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, Paul McCartney gets there, and they're on stage playing Come Go With Me, which is a Del Vikings track. Um, Paul meets John after that set and um, plays a few songs for John. He played 20 Flight Rock. Bebop Alula and a medley of uh, Little Richard songs. And then, um, you know, a few weeks go by and uh, Pete Shotton, who was a guitarist in the Quarrymen, um, in a chance meeting, sees Paul and says, hey, you know, you ought to you ought to join our band. And, and just, so, just for the record, he's playing these songs on guitar because he was a guitar player at the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah and that that was what really impressed John, because he. um you know, he felt that he was the lead singer and in charge and no one's better than me. And here's this kid who can really play guitar uh, far a better. Better than guitarist John. than John Lennon. And, yeah. and John had to go, whoa, shit. Well, I need this guy in the band. And um, so that's uh, and then like a year later, uh, George joins uh, in 58. But he was 14. And that was what uh, John was hesitant uh, at the beginning because George was so young. Right. Um, but uh, John, at this point in uh, 59, um, John is, is more and more obsessed with rock and roll. Um, the one connection that John and Paul had, uh, John's mother dies when he's like 15 and Paul McCartney lost his mom too. Yep. And so I think the two of them, really found um, almost a, a, a brother in the storm kind of thing. Yeah, that, um, was, a, that was a common bond between them. That, yeah. that and songwriting. They, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And well, I think they, they really uh, one-upped each other constantly, yeah. and they, they really honed their uh, songwriting well, yeah. skills. Um, but uh, they, they would play in and around Liverpool, um, they they really right away they really had standout vocal harmonies uh they just seemed to rise above the norm uh with all the other bands and um john was just very uh aggressive in his um stage presence and i just i feel like i hate to to say it like like almost like the beatles were the very first uh, metal band where they played a little faster. They yeah. had a little raw uh, edge if you, to them. If you, I was going to say, if you look at those pictures the of them back then, they, they, they were greasers. They wore leather jackets. Their hair was slicked back. They were kind of badass motherfuckers. Yeah. It wasn't um, until, and, and I'm sure you'll get to it, but it wasn't until Brian Epstein, uh, started managing them that he cleaned up their look and told them to wear suits and all which, that stuff. Which is a great parallel to Elvis Presley and uh, post uh, getting out of the army. Same mm -hmm. time frame, 1960. Uh, he's now back from the army. His mom's died and he's singing, um, you know, fame and fortune and, uh, uh, you know, really watered down. uh love songs versus uh jailhouse rock you know yeah the thing about the beatles is uh when they they wrote really fucking good love songs you know what i mean it was yeah, well, a they, lot better they, than the schmaltzy stuff presley got into eventually you know yeah i i and i think that's from paul possibly uh i always looked at it as paul syruping the shit out of it and john chipping it down to to being mm -hmm. a little more yeah uh they and balanced you, each other off for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, keep it keep it not sappy. Yes. Yeah. 
uh, so so they suffered the, from not the, having the, a good drummer. The primo example of that is Paul's lyric, it's getting better all the time, and John adding, it couldn't get much worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Anyways, but, keep going. So they, they suffered from not having a good drummer, and they needed a bass player. And so around this time, uh, you know, 1960, John Lennon's uh, art school friend, Stuart Sutcliffe, um, was not a musician at all. He was a, an artist. Yeah. And uh, John's like, hey, here, hold this bass. And, um, you know, they're up on stage banging away. Um, you couldn't really hear the bass anyway. And a lot of the PA systems. Kind of like the Sex great. Pistols. Well, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the PA systems weren't that great. So it, it wasn't like today where you've got a good bass drum no. back and forth. And, he know. would turn his back to the the audience because he didn't he he, he was embarrassed so he thought sure. people would, would would find out would that see that he, really, couldn't play. he couldn't play mm -hmm. but uh, did you guys see the movie backbeat by any chance oh uh, yeah. yeah yeah with uh, I did not. Uh -uh. uh yeah. with uh tom hanks no 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 not no tom hanks oh that's that thing you do the, backbeat yeah, yeah, with, you know uh, back backbeat was a mid 90s film i know with, i saw it no big stars, but it really captured, I thought, the, well, the Beatles in Hamburg, that whole era, the, the era we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is Paul had issues with Stu. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and fist, they would have fist fights and he's bitching to John. John. He's like, John, he just stands there. And John says, it's the way he stands. Uh, yeah he was yeah, yeah so he had this kind of cool about him which is part of why he was in the band and again that's very similar to um i'm looking for backbeat and i can't find it but if we find a link maybe we'll drop it in the click pit but um uh it's very similar to uh john lyden getting uh sid vicious in the sex pistols uh when their original bass player quit yeah. yeah, he had the stance, he had the look, yeah. he had everything, but he yeah. couldn't fucking play. They, the Sex Pistols would actually, when they were on tour, they would just unplug his yeah. bass from the album. Yeah. and he didn't play. Uh, he didn't play the uh, bass lines on the album. But anyways, uh, I think and, Sutcliffe was probably a little better than Sid Vicious, but a you know. little, maybe a little. And he gets the girl. He gets Astrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, during their during their um so where where did i leave off here um he was extremely he was more of an artist than uh, a musician and his parents had really foot the bill for his college and everything and then he goes and joins a rock band um you know which was not to his parents liking but um then we we did discuss that uh Stu and john renamed the band in 1960 uh, from the quarrymen to uh, the Beatles, and it was E E T L. What, wasn't it the Silver Beatles first? Well, it was so it was the Beatles with right. with uh, all E's. Then John changed it to the beat, like music, right. because right. he liked the double entendre of crickets, yeah. uh, which is a sport and uh, you know a, a bug. Yeah, and um, so the Beatles, and then they they had a, a myriad of. Uh, the Beatles, the Silver Beatles, John and the Silver Beatles, and then hmm. then just the Beatles. Um, but by mid-August of 60, um, they got Pete Best on drums, and uh, Alan Williams was their uh, kind of uh, fake manager. Uh, he secured a three-and-a-half-month residency in Hamburg. Uh, Hamburg's red light district, and you had clubs over there that they would they would bring bands uh, from around Europe, and basically it was like, listen, you're gonna play uh, seven gigs a day. Yeah, it's seven sets. Yeah. Seven <laughs> sets. Um, watch out for the bottles that that might fly your way. Uh, if they don't like you, they're you're probably going to get your ass beat. So it was it was, it was like dangerous. the country and western bar in the Blues Brothers, basically. Sort of, but there's yeah, no yeah, there's yeah. no uh, 
there's no chicken wire. It's no just yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's you in the in the air and some guy in German screaming at you and you're up right. there flubbing right. a, a line and you know. So they this really, is why we killed your grandfather. Yeah, it's, yeah. What, what is it? Within what 15, 20 years of you the, know, yeah, the war. war. Yeah, this yeah. I guess it would be your father. Hey, let's go. Yeah. Killed your father. I'm sure yeah. there was still some you you had to oh, watch yeah, your ass. Weird, you know? I'm oh sure God. there was some weirdness still. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, but uh so you had uh it was a, a strip club that had been uh turned into a nightclub, the Indra Club, right? I N D R A. Uh and um, you know, they get there and there's like two little dressing rooms in the back that they would basically sleep. Uh, it just chaos. Um, and the, the type of uh, atmosphere that I don't think any of us could endure if we weren't 16, 17 and, and on our own for the first time. Uh, all the beer you could drink. Um, they were taking Preluden, which is like a speed. And um, yeah. so it was just booze, drugs and strippers. And uh, and playing all the all the rock and roll that you could think of, they, they really sharpened the diamond. Just wanted to drink beer and hear some music. Yeah. You know? They sharpened the diamond during that period, though. It's like forged oh, by yeah. fire they, kind they of thing. They certainly cut their teeth. Cut their yeah. teeth. Yeah, um, they had to. They had to be in, like, inventive too, um, just because they you know they couldn't always be understood. So they they yeah. they, they kept. I think the the manager there always his phrase was Mac Shaw, make show, yeah, yeah. you know, or they had yeah, so they, uh, they Bruno Koshmeyer were Nazis, you know, and things like that. You know, it was yeah. Uh, Bruno Koshmeyer was yeah, the wait, manager. what did they, what, Alan, hold on, yeah. slow down. Alan, what did you just say? What did they do? They would do skits, you know, it's like pretending they right. were Nazis, you know, you know, da, you know, okay. <laughs> The, yeah, John it, was it. John yeah. was fearless. The goose step. So they know, would they were make making fun of him, making fun of the crowd a little oh, yeah. bit, a little bit of punk rock there early on. Yeah, yeah. oh they, totally. Yeah. John was absolutely fearless, yeah. and and a lot of all of that was learned here in Hamburg, and then by the time Brian Epstein sees them in '61, uh, um, he sees four guys that that have a stage presence. But he also sees how they're chain smoking up on stage. They're cussing. Uh, a fist fight yeah. might break out between Paul and Stu. Right. There was just no, uh, you know, Brian yeah, they, wanted they to streamline they, that. They, you know? they were, you know, I, they were, I mean, derelicts, really. They didn't, I don't know that any of them finished high school. No. For real. Right. Well, I so, know John yeah. and Paul didn't. George yeah. hated school. Right. They all played hooky, yeah. right? They they, they Yeah. They the funny school. thing is too is like when it, when they when both bands get famous, the Beatles have the good guy image and the Stones have the bad boy image, but right. according to Lemmy, yeah. The reason Stones why Stones Lemmy- all went to college. The right. reason why Lemmy liked the Beatles more is because they were badasses from a tough neighborhood and the Stones were a bunch of spoiled rich kids. We don't know that. But right. Lemmy knew that because he's from uh, England, you know. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, so so they're over plan, you know, you know, basically twenty four hours a day, uh, banging whores and and taking all this speed. And uh, the Indra Club, um, they're playing there, but they they also take a couple gigs at the Top Ten Club. Well, this went against what Bruno uh, Koshmeyer, their their owner that that hired them, this was a breach of contract. Uh, them playing at the top ten club, so he's basically got a he's got it out for them. Um, he uh, rats out George Harrison for being underage, so George gets deported back to Liverpool uh, late November of sixty uh, one. Right. or of 60 and then um uh pete and and pete best and paul mccartney uh light a used condom uh in a concrete hallway they light this thing on fire and so bruno has them arrested for uh for trying to start a fire and they're just kids you know they're kids and they yeah. see this used condom and they light it on fire and they're laughing probably 
blasted on Prelude and and uh, and right. drunk. And um, so he gets them arrested and they get deported as well. Um, yeah. During all these gigs and stuff, though, one night uh, Astrid and um, Klaus Vorman, who went on to play bass for Paul McCartney and Wings in the 70s, sure. um, yeah. but Klaus Vorman and Astrid come in, very Art Deco, uh, goth before goth. They come in all serious um, uh, Euro trash, you know, and... Was it what, what, Dieter from Sprockets? Is that Basically. Yeah. Thank okay. you. That's what I was right. looking for. I yeah, knew you, yeah. I, you were yeah. catching my... Uh, <laughs> right. So Astrid was drop-dead gorgeous. She really was very attractive. Um, reminiscent of uh, Nico in the underground. There you go. Just that straight, yeah. blonde, just gorgeous. <clears throat> Statuesque but, um, beauty kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of people were like, holy fuck, look at her. But... Um, she became smitten with uh, Stuart Sutcliffe. And so when John goes home that December, um, Stu stays in Hamburg because he's basically living in her loft apartment that was above her mom's house. And he was staying up there. He had a little studio and, and would paint and stuff. And so they're kind of doing the art thing. Um, but Sutcliffe is still kind of in the band. Um, so they all go home that Christmas and they didn't see each other. They just spent three months basically living on top of each other. And so they all go home, uh, filthy and, you know, been awake forever. It's like a detox. Um, and then they, they meet up and do a couple gigs. Um, and then, um, Meanwhile, Stu and Astrid are like madly in love and getting engaged. Um, so the gigs, when they meet up and do gigs, this is without Stu? No, Stu's back in the... Uh, yeah, without yeah. Stu. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So they're playing like the Cavern. They're doing all these things. And is but, McCartney uh, on bass then at this point? No, no. They, they basically just don't have a bass player at this point. Okay. Um, so then they, they do... Um, they go back to Hamburg. It's still... 61 uh to continue the band more horrors more prelude and um gigs are hours long like we said bar fights strippers um so at this point Sutcliffe leaves the band in hopes of marriage to Astrid and continuing uh in art school and stuff at that point while they're in um Hamburg Paul takes over bass uh now it's John and and George on uh, rhythm and lead and Paul's on bass, and then uh, Bert Kampfert, uh, this this uh, German over there, he gets them as backing for Tony Sheridan. Now, Tony Sheridan was very popular around England. Now, Tony Sheridan was just a wild man. Um, he might drop trow on stage, dick out, running around. The guy was nuts. And, so he and was he, the G.G. Allen of... Um, you just did uh, not know what this guy was going to do. Yeah. And apparently he was very well endowed and he didn't mind throwing this horse leg out uh, on stage and um, was quite popular in and around uh, Europe. And so uh, the Beatles get a chance to back him on an album. And so that's how that Tony Sheridan with the Beat Brothers uh, occurred. And so that's, that's, what were, a, that's what the album was, Tony Sheridan with the Beat Brothers? Yeah, the Beat was, Brothers. Yeah. So when and, you see it now and it says Tony Sheridan oh, with the a, Beatles. Well, now it's got the picture of the Beatles with Stuart yeah. Sutcliffe. And it says, right. uh, in the beginning, which that's on CD, and it's right. it's that album. But you got can it. also find it as Tony Sheridan with the Beatles. So originally uh, it was Tony Sheridan with the Beat Brothers. Yeah, well, originally it was Tony Sheridan you know, epic this is just like years. the history of the three stooges. You just originally small, had Ted Healy and his stooges. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Very small writing beat, bro. You know, is no one noticed that. Yeah. They were the was, backing band. Yeah. yeah basically. They were yeah. just, Whoa, this, he's got it. He's got yeah, the fucking well, this, album. This is when they reissued it. And it's now yeah, it's the, Beatles. the Beatles featuring Tony. Now they flipped it around. Yeah. yeah. They flipped it around. That's, 
Nice, nice. Anyway, that's yeah. still got to be pretty old. The what's that in the seventies or the sixties? Probably the seventies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This came out seventy something. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Mid seventies. So, Alan breaking out the rare vinyl. Oh, yeah. It's usually Silky doing that, but no, Alan has staged well, the all rare. my all my little oh, Beatles stuff is in boxes. So. <laughs> sure it is. Sure. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. yeah no problem. Uh, Silky, meanwhile, has an extensive Quiet Riot memor memorabilia collection. One, um, <laughs> one uh, version of that that I have on CD is called In the Beginning, and it's a photo of them mm -hmm. on the train. Uh, they're they're on like a, a empty train car, leaned up against it, oh, all in yes. leather. And, oh, that's and, a classic, classic photo. Stuart Sutcliffe's in there, and um, that uh that's the cd but uh there is a vinyl with another picture yeah. um it might be the original uh tony sheridan version okay. yeah anyway um so they played on that the the two songs that are worth hearing from the album um there's uh my bonnie which is tony sheridan singing but it's a great song and then the flip side was John singing Ain't She Sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Bubba. You nailed it. <laughs> and that's uh that's that's the two yes, songs man. from that album that you really want to hear. And the, oh, there was also an instrumental called Cayenne, which is the <laughs> only instrumental apart from Blue Jay Way that the Beatles would would do in their uh canon. I have to ask is are these essential songs on our playlist that we're going to Yes, have? if you go to uh, in spite of all the danger which is that uh playlist I start with with all of that stuff it goes chronologically of how all that stuff and it's a great way to see just what was being put out and and how it came out. Um a lot of people don't realize that the the British versions and the American versions and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, just the delay and what what America heard oh, yeah. first. Right. Um, yeah. So November of sixty one, um, they're playing Liverpool's The Cavern, and they meet Brian Epstein. And Epstein comes in. Um, he'd been told by uh, people. Uh, so Brian Epstein ran Nem's Records. Uh, New England something or yeah. you know anyway it was a record store that his dad his dad owned a, a very similar to what um, Cowboy Mock Bell had um, where his dad owned a, a building and they were selling stuff and there was a little music area too uh, but Brian kept getting um, requests for My Bonnie and um Ain't she sweet? And he's like, "What? What? What are you talking about?" And and having to order this shit. Um, so he goes down to the cavern and sees these four guys, cigarettes everywhere. Um, their stage presence was was really raw. Swigging whiskey, shooting up heroin on stage in between <laughs> well, songs, just fighting, and you know, but but John could work a crowd. Yeah. Um, but I would say, you know, you go over. To Hamburg in that time, fifteen years after the war, you got to be razor sharp, man. You, I, mean, yeah. I, I don't know, many of us could could have handled that. Uh, Buddy Holly probably would have gotten his ass kicked. I'm sure and yeah. they would have broke his glasses and sent him back. And yep. he was from Texas, so he might have shot somebody. Uh, you you know. never know. Yeah. Um, but um, so before all of that, if you go back to '58. They had recorded a Buddy Holly song called That'll Be the Day with uh, a Paul original called In Spite of All the Danger. And I that's what I start the playlist off with. Those are extremely rare uh, recordings. How they survived is amazing. Um, that was back in 58 as the Quarrymen. Um, and, you know, being on Tony Sheridan's album was great. But were they these were, the, the songs they recorded on like a little two track recorder in an attic yeah. or something? Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. Wow. So they, and they carried this album. The, the members of the quarrymen would would take the album home and play it. And how nobody broke this record or, you know, um, yeah. how it survived. That's is, crazy. And to your point earlier, Snags, about so they didn't have a bass player 
you know, at this point. They were a guitar band. They just, it was the three of them all just playing guitar. They were a guitar group yeah. you know, for, for yeah. a long time. And it's not like today where you think the, the, the foundation of any band is the bass yeah. and drums. Bass yeah. and drums. And they had neither for years. Yeah. And, and again, the PA systems, as soon as they start playing, they just want to hear uh, Paul screaming, I saw Aunt Mary coming through the alley, you know. Uh, th they weren't trying to have the nuance of the bass and, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. But uh, So they were on a mission to, to want to have their own record. The Tony Sheridan thing was great. They, they'd done that that little um, uh, acetate of that'll be the day and, and in spite of all the danger. But, uh, you know, they really wanted to do something that was theirs. And so Brian Epstein you know, basically says, look, I want to be your manager. And they're like, yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, they, they just kind of threw themselves at every opportunity. And it's amazing that they, they didn't end up um, never being heard of, you know, because too many bands trust the first guy that comes along and, yeah. you know, um, but Billy, Brian, Billy Joel's manager ripped off like $90 million from him. Oh, totally got, changed. Oh yeah. Totally Billy Joel changed. got, he he's got the, ripped off like multiple times. He's the poster boy. Like, yeah. Yeah, I know, but it's it like, totally damn, changed bro. his personality. He was this gregarious, generous, yeah. naive person, and he became very cynical and just out for himself yeah. after that. But anyways, uh, I digress. So um, <laughs> they cut a 12-song demo for Decca. Um, Epstein shops 12 all songs. around. Say that again. Not, Sorry, you, you, you they, dropped they, out on my feed. Say it again. Uh, they cut a 12 song demo for Decca. So they right. do like Besame Mucho, um, Three Cool Cats. They do a bunch of, and I, I included a lot of that in, in the playlist so you can hear that stuff. Um, and it's just really, it's cool to hear those, yeah. them at that time, yeah. you know. Um, but so while all this is going on from 1958 to, to 1961, they're songwriting. They're constantly playing anywhere. They did schools, weddings, parties. They they just threw themselves at anything, um, much like Van Halen playing backyard parties. You know, they right. just anywhere and any didn't matter. Um, but at this point, you know, it's it's you know the candles burning down. Um, Brian is in fear of losing their trust, so he he goes hat in hand to Parlophone at Abbey Road Studios, and um, uh, George Martin, just upon hearing about them and uh, Brian's um, excitement about them, in a, I, I guess you're just not going to run into this now, but Brian uh, or George uh, Martin is like, you know what, um, let me meet them. And if I like them, I'll record them all based on, on Brian's word, you know, didn't, uh, and there, uh, didn't Decca pass on the Beatles because guitar yeah. music was going out. They're guitar like, yeah. are on the way Thank, out. thanks yeah. for recording yeah. that demo, but we're going to pass because guitar music yeah. is on its way out. Yeah. And, that was and really fucking smart. What's interesting. If you, if you know Decca, uh, there was later when the Beatles were, you know, this is probably in uh 60, 62 63 uh they had a, a contest and all the local bands and the winner would get to meet george harrison and um get a recording contract with decca and so bizarrely george is sitting next to the decca guy that turned them down and that turned them down and the guy says to george hey no hard feelings george like oh whatever and uh, and he says, um, who do you like here? And George is like, well, I, I haven't heard anybody here yet because it had just started. But he's like, there's a great band uh, called, in the Rolling Stones. called the Rolling Stones. Yeah. The guy the guy immediately leaves the uh, contest and hauls ass to England to sign the Rolling Stones. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's what, that was their consolation prize. They just snatched hilarious up the Stones. To me. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I'm sure I would, the Stones would have been scooped up at some point, but. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. And I, would too, 
and I say thank you, Decca, because if they accept and take the Beatles, they don't they don't meet George Martin. Mm. And, yeah, interesting. Holy shit. Now what happens? Holy that's some shit. that's some mind fuck I mean, shit right there to I mean, think about. It would have been yeah. great still, but yeah, but I yeah. I, I I tell uh, you, you you look at Van Halen without Ted Templeman, yeah. I can't do it. You know, and, no. and same yeah. is something of and and these those are two examples of a band that found their producer and said, okay, this is this is it. We're this not this is a guy. Yeah, we're not fucking around with anybody. Door, else doors, like, Paul Rothschild, no. same yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so so um, George Martin has them come in, and they they play a couple songs. They do "Love Me Do" and some other stuff. And um, you know, this is in front of the the top of the heap at uh, Abbey Road Studios. They're all very serious. They wore tie. They dressed up. They didn't just come dragging in. These so were business, Martin yeah, business, businessmen. It's very yeah. serious shit. Uh, George yeah. Martin hears them, and and they're playing this "Love Me Do" song, and he's like, "Yeah, what else you got?" And and they do like a slow, a slower version of "Please Please Me," and he's like, "Yeah, you know, all right, you know." He's just at this point, he's a lot. You know, he told them he'd record them. Um, so they uh you know they they're kicking it around and they're like you know we just we just don't like this drummer we really don't like um they didn't like pete best and so john was just like oh is that all okay you're out of the fucking you know get him. <laughs> john, was on, can't a stay. john yeah. was on a mission you know pete best um, was also uh kind of like sutcliffe he was kind of stealing the attention away from them based on his looks so that was that was part of it too, I think. Yeah, I have heard that, but the the this um, Bob Spitz wrote a book called The Beatles. I, I, I'm the one who recommended it to you. Yeah, yeah. it is uh, it is epic in that I'm I'm currently reading it. I'm up to page 500, and they have yet to uh, finish talking about with the Beatles the second album. Yeah, it's so, an in depth fucking book. It's wow. it's a uh, yeah. He may it's not a, have mentioned the whole the whole it's a bit long in the tooth, right? He may not have mentioned that whole thing, but but uh, Pete Best was kind of a teen idol. Uh, oh yeah, the very Elvis, uh, you know, biker and look with the taking the attention back. away from John and Paul. So that's, yeah. I'm sure that was part of it. But but uh, I I I do think uh, Ringo was a much better drummer. Oh, yeah. Um, so they had like like Hamburg, they had these areas that they had um, people would go on holiday and there'd be these tents all along the, the beach and uh, people would stay in the, the cooler air up there and uh, bands would go up and, and almost like um, a residency they would play. And so John and Paul drive all the way out to this, uh, this one area uh, and they, they, get a hold of Ringo's band that he was currently in and um, he had come recommended and they, they basically sit down with some of the band and Ringo and they're like, look, we want you in our band. And the band, the other band was like, man, the Beatles want you, you know, you ought to go and do it. You know, this, this, uh, he, they had already had such a buzz. Um, and so Ringo, uh, was really hesitant, but he comes and plays and they, they, they do, there's three versions of love me do. So there's a version with uh, Ringo that uh, George Martin was like, you know, I'm going to bring this session guy in. Uh, I believe his name was Alan white. A Andy white, Andy white. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Andy white plays. And that's the version that um, George Martin really liked but Ringo was very hurt by this. And so uh, George Martin reluctantly releases the, um, the Ringo version, which came out. And that single didn't, didn't generate a lot, um, which I did not realize. I, I always thought that, you know, they were right out of the chute, you yeah. know, all flames going. And um, yeah. I think it went to number 17. Yeah, it, it, it did it was, well. 
Yeah. Um, but the next song was Please Please Me. Right. And that uh, sped up. They they worked on it and they sped it up. And it was like, it was like crack cocaine. It swept across. England just blew up at this. Yeah. Yep. And then the, the first album comes out March of 63. Um, before that, though, Stuart Sutcliffe dies of a brain hemorrhage uh, April 10th of 62. He was 21 years old. Um, how how did he, he got mugged or something, right? Well, he that had a brain hemorrhage. He'd been complaining about these headaches. But in uh, Hamburg, fights would break out and stuff. And he did get... Um, he did get mugged. Somebody bashed his head in pretty good. Yeah, yeah. again, backbeat. Backbeat does a pretty good dramatic. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, uh, I've got some sources where we might be able to uh, find a somewhere where you can order the DVD at least. So if I can find, it's that, a good I'll link movie. I, I've, I do yeah. remember that. I'll link it on the click pit. It's, it's, yeah. it's ringing a vague bell for me too. I may have seen it, but I'm, I'm gonna, the, I'm gonna the, watch it again. What I remember about Backbeat the most was that uh, loft with uh, Astrid and Stu and the guys there. And it, it, yeah. it was really cool to see that era played out. Um, I like that a lot. Yep. Agreed. So Stu Sutcliffe dies. And you think about John losing his mother, uh, you know, I think in 1960 or 59. Um, and, uh, you know, he's raised by his aunt and uh, John, was, lo John losing his mother basically just directed the rest of his life. A lot of the choices oh, yeah. he made yeah, he, it, it, <coughs> Yoko <coughs> will be because of that, you know, it, it shattered he, him. He uh, lost her twice uh, because she wasn't fit to, to raise him in her mind. Yeah. She, yeah. Was, yeah. Fast, she was kind of fast and loose. She didn't, yeah. you know, he was kind of an anchor. Her, so. Yeah, she it's it's very to me it's it's almost exactly like uh Jimi Hendrix. Um hmm. mother was real oh, yeah. uh never there and and then she's gone. And Hendrix's is, Hendrix's and, mother was the village bicycle for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, but then when John was a teenager, she, she came around more because she could relate to him more, and they they started yeah. to rebuild that relationship. She and, taught him how to play uh the banjo and stuff. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, group and stuff. And then she got taken away. Got That's ran over fucking rough. By a drunk police officer. It was nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a cut through in these high bushes that are in some of the neighborhoods there, and she just jumped out, and this car was right there. Right, yeah. so, um. So anyway, um. So please, please me comes out, and and it just England is on fire with the Beatles. Meanwhile, over in America, um, Capitol Records, which is a, a subsidiary of Parlophone um, in England. So really, Parlophone's the boss, but Capitol's over in America doing what they want to do. And they're they're selling. And at the time, whatever the pop stuff, how much is that dog in the window? Hot diggity, dog diggity, just a bunch of horse shit. Um, Paul Anka, you know. Um, no, don't don't mess just, with Paul Anka. Come on, yeah, man. You know, <laughs> they call it puppy love. You know, all this stuff's out, and just not a lot of um, grit. Uh, you know, and then uh, or so, just good songwriting, right? Yeah. The 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 ongoing thing though was any English bands that came along, they went, oh, they're from England, and they just kind of throw it to the side. So um, you know. They get sent Love Me Do. They get sent Please Please Me. And they're not even being played in America in 63. So, um, you know, the, the, it would go unheard in America at that time. Uh, Ed Sullivan is in Europe and somehow uh, runs into Brian Epstein. And uh, just on word of mouth and the buzz of the Beatles, because Beatlemania was all over the papers in England, Ed's like, uh, hey, we ought to have them on the show. And so Brian pounces. It's like, yeah, let's have them on the show. So that uh, they didn't get over there till February of 64. By this point, uh, they had released some more singles. Uh, they're still like mad songwriting, uh, really, you know, honing their craft. And, I got, uh, I got another 
th this is what you would have had if, if you could find it at that introducing time. Introducing the Beatles, yeah. It's on VJ Records. Yep, yep. Yeah. So that's got oh. I Want to Hold Your Hand and what else? Um, no, it's it's actually, I saw, saw her standing there. This is oh, okay. basically, it's basically Please Please Me without Please Please Me and uh, another song or whatever. It's a, Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's got the whole. I thought that was the EP. Okay, so that's the VJ. Yeah, busting yeah. out the rare shit. Yeah, so oh, that's yeah. the first album. That's the that's, first album that's that VJ the one had. that you and, could get here in America. So yeah, VJ was oh, a wow. subsidiary of Capital, and right. that's what yeah. came out. Um, but interesting. It took the the single, the non-album single. I want to hold your hand. Came yeah. out. Right. in america and that ripped it open um, yeah. the the beatles did uh three appearances on ed sullivan and uh it was like the most watched tv show uh immediately you got that guy that says hey i want to i want to make beetle uh wigs and all in got immediately what you immediately had from the ed sullivan appearance was thousands of A kids across the Thousands of kids across the nation who wanted to start a band like the Beatles. Every bio, I yeah. can't tell you how many rock bios I've read yeah. that they'll cover the childhood, but the, 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 the spark to get into music, every fucking bio you read yeah. was every, seeing every, the Beatles on Ed yeah. Sullivan. Catching that Ed Sullivan show. And, yes. and you can, yes. the direct comparison is that uh, American blues tour that went through England in 63 and everybody saw Muddy Waters and, you know, all, and out comes uh, John Mayall and, and Alan, Alec, uh, Al Cooper and uh, Fleetwood Mac and Led Zeppelin and Jeff Beck. Yeah, yeah. And, just, yeah. and then, and then, and then you skip another generation and it's the Ramones. They come to England and yeah. Cats from the Clash yeah. and the Sex Pistols, all those guys were at that show in London. Yeah. So it's it's um, a lot of back and forth. But. Yeah, and that's that's what's so beautiful, the mutations that occur, uh, you know, almost like germ warfare, you know, what what sprouts up out of the mold, you know. Yeah, that's um, a beautiful analogy, really touching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so Ed Sullivan just, just like germ warfare. Ed Sullivan, um, 1964, chaos, Beatlemania. Uh, when the Beatles landed in America, they left all these fans in England that were, you know, all these girls crying, please come back safe, all that shit. And they go over to the unknown and they're not even, they're not even heard on the radio yet. But when they land in uh, America, there were, uh, you know, three, 4,000 uh, they girls were swarmed at the, at the airport, yeah, screaming yeah. their asses off. Uh, more so when they left, but uh, when they got there, there was a, a pretty good crowd. But um, then they, you know, they're they're hit. It's just a whirlwind of of hotels and and uh, girls trying to climb the the sides of the hotel to get into their rooms. Um, they got a three movie deal. Hard Day's Night is is going to get made. Um, but, uh, with the Beatles, the second album that comes out November of 63. And, uh, then the, the non-album single, I want to hold your hand. But I was pointing out that when I said at the beginning of the show, how these guys really ch changed how the music industry works, um, the demand, uh, advanced, uh, demand for, I want to hold your hand was astronomical. Uh, the the numbers had not been seen ever, so uh, it, it really the, these you know VJ Records was not ready no. for that. No. You know? no. Uh, so uh, I believe everything after that, uh, you know, uh, Meet the Beatles and all that was was through Capital. Um, yes, and it became a cash cow. It was it was uh, you know next level for them. Um, but, uh, with the Beatles was the second album, um, their, their tour, they did a, a U.S. tour in 64. Well, what was interesting to me is they, they went back because of, of how Hamburg really, uh, they were able to cut their teeth. They, uh, did a, a German 45 
uh, single uh, with Come Give Me Diner Hand, which is oh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and then Siliptik, which is uh, She Loves You on the flip side. So they, they actually did two German songs. Which are on the playlist. On the playlist, of yeah, course. On the playlist, yeah. Um, but, uh, and they're just uh, very interesting to hear them in that German, uh, but a, a, a gift to the fans for sure. Um, sure. And then, um, so if you guys, I'm just rambling, if you guys have anything to add here, well, one, uh, one of the things that happened, you know, they start touring uh, still during this period. We're, this this episode, we're doing 58 to 64. 64, and we're closing in on the end here. When was the first major tour of the U.S. where they're playing all these baseball stadiums and stuff? Uh, that Well, they, they had a, a whirlwind tour in 64 and played so when around. They, when they come to the Ed Sullivan show, then they did a tour, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so what it, it was, was small, like though. it wasn't it wasn't like a you know well so i don't so i know we're not supposed to talk about after 64 in this episode but i'm gonna i don't know when this was so i'm just gonna throw it out there sure. when they're when they're touring and they're playing these big uh you know uh big uh Arenas. venues that would have been like 65 and 66. All right. Well, I started talking anyway, so I'll finish my no, thought. Yes, nice. They didn't have, when you go to a concert now, they've got these giant PA systems that are set up for these. Well, in when the Beatles are touring these big halls, bands weren't really playing them. Those were for boxing matches and hockey matches and, yeah. and, yeah. and, 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 you know, uh, basketball, whatever they would have in their political conventions. And so when you, you imagine going to like a baseball game and you hear an announcement over the, the, the announcer's PA, you know, going out the first base, we have, yeah, that's, what echo. The, that's right. what the music was going through. Yeah. That's it the was Chase going Stadium. Through, right. That's the it Chase Stadium. Going, yeah. It was yeah. going through that announcer's PA. It wasn't a big concert. And so it was basically yeah. screaming and yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, kind of in the background behind all the screaming. And I don't think so, you can hear anything. Yeah. I, so yeah. Shea Stadium is full of screaming kids. Uh, a helicopter comes down. They all run out, get on the stage. They're way down your nosebleed, back of the rack, and you can kind of see somebody's yeah. on the stage. And <laughs> they're just miming uh there were times john would tell them all to shut the fuck up and it didn't they can't hear you know they yeah like yeah. literally would just mime through it yeah and then i, th I think keith keith richards on. talks like about that in his in his book life as well yeah. the early tours where it's just they didn't have the pa system to compete with the screaming fans Right. And yeah. Keith was like, you would just get up there. You wouldn't even hear yourself play. You're just kind of going through the motions. You go through but, the um, motions, but but the kids are fanatics. They're, they're If yeah. God forbid they do get a hold of you, they're going to rip you apart. Yeah. And and so I get it later when they go, you know, we're fucking done. This is crazy. Well, it's also before, I mean, what that forced was the innovation of the arena and stadium-sized PA systems that were yeah the, meant the for large smart people that yeah somebody watching this goes holy shit I mean they really the Beatles nobody else the Beatles made the entire industry rethink itself yeah and yeah. go fuck we have to we have to come up with a better sound system to have these concerts I don't know that you really had concert tours like you did right. until the Beatles because yeah, right. Elvis played elvis played the circuit in these small clubs yeah these Cash, barn, all, barnstorming review tours where you'd have chuck berry and bill it, haley and all these guys on the same yeah. bill and they did yeah. that that was short-lived because you know the music changed people weren't listening to chuck right. berry uh, the way they did anyway so that's another innovation they forced and then so they retire from touring and the stones take full advantage of that new technology and and but um, yeah, all the we'll get we'll get to we'll get to all that. It just it just popped up when you were talking about yeah. these shows with the screaming fans. Um, so the third album, "A Hard Day's Night," comes out July of '64. Um, there was an American version of the album that had 
some of had like five songs from the out from the movie, but then had instrumental versions of those songs. Uh, Al- that Alan has of- walked off to grab another yes, rare. There it Here is. he goes. He's got that so right there. Every rare album we mention, Alan that just picks my, it up and shows us to us on the that webcam. Was, See, I played yeah. the living shit out of that. Alan, right. do not do not mention your address. We don't want people no, robbing no, no. your house. Taking no, these what, what I love about this album is it has a version of "And I Love Her." Yes, with, instrumental. With Paul, no, it's but well, yeah, but then it's got a, the the you know the vocal version, but Paul is not double tracked. Yes, it's, it's a single vocal. Yeah, yeah I it, almost think that's the movie version of the song. Yes, I think you're right. Um, but anyway. so that was different from yeah. the uh, the album "A Hard Day's Night," uh, which you can see is like all blue and has their faces all the way across. Um, and uh, so the album Since tracks, like just like the Stones, would differ from England and America, um, which had to be version. confusing. It had to be confusing, but that, the, that continued all the way up through the Clash. Just, yeah, I don't it, know why they used to do that. It's, it's it, annoying. If anything, it made the fan buy two uh, albums. Just, yeah. The, yeah, two or three, and then yeah. the EP. There'd be an EP with some of the, you know, it, ACDC, same it, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um. So so then uh, after Hard Day's Night, um, you know that album, the movie comes out, and if you yeah, see that movie, fucking uh, beautiful. Actually, it's an amazing. I watched that today. It's um, it's one of the most beautifully photographed films. The cinematography in that is just yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really it's, well uh, done. It's it it's very much though to me. It's very much a vehicle for the songs that the Beatles mm-hmm. had at that time. Um, where it's not really a story, and here we're singing, and and they do a song, the, the and it's fine is, though, because it's, you're there to see the Beatles, so you want to see them. No, there's a lot of funny Marx Brothers style improv. Yes. When they were getting ready to make this movie, they watched a lot of Marx Brothers movies, and you can tell. And and it's it for me, it's the best Beatles movie. I think it's really tight as far as the way it's edited and put together. El Condor back El to Condor. pimp the website again. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, real important stuff. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that's taken care but, of. Uh, yeah, but so so there's there's it it is a time capsule though for the Beatle mania, the insanity, the They're fans running, chasing constantly, them. yeah, running from uh, fans. Yeah. There's an there's an opening scene in that movie where George just busts his ass flat, just face oh. plant. Oh my God. Right. Yeah. Face plant. And face it plant. hurts. It, it hurts face. my stern. You're just it like, does. Jesus yeah. Christ. And, but George is back up and running and you see John look back like Jesus Christ. <laughs> are you all right? And George is laughing, but they're running. And I'm like, no, did cut that hurt. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you see if you watch it, if you watch it right now, as they're running out of the frame, George like shakes his like he he hurt his uh, oh. his hand too. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, if you if you brutal. if if you I went through a phase where I just watched all the Beatles movies in a row, and Hard Day's Night stands out to me as the the most well put together, best one. It's entertaining from beginning to end. Um, help, in my opinion, gets a little rambling with the plot. Yellow yeah, submarine I think they is to have more of a story for help, but help. But was they ended up the having team. less of a story in a way. Yeah, because because yeah. they wanted to have all these locate. They had all this money. Yeah. They're like, hey, sure, let's yeah. go skiing. Hey, yeah, let's go this, skiing. There's this hey, evil bad go. guy. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. but and then and then yellow submarine is you know trippy and wild, and then let it be is that's a great documentary that's probably my second favorite one i but, will um, add since since you mentioned uh let it be let it be i don't know when this happened but today i discovered it it's on disney plus yeah. for yeah. the first time in 50 years that's because the, the movie that's because, let it be that's is, because the uh the the mini series because of that, Peter Jackson's miniseries was so popular, it forced them to release Let It Be. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I had to get a bootleg DVD wait. of it a couple of years I ago. I can't wait to yeah. finally own a, a, a cuz I've got a bootleg of Let yeah. It Be. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> it's yeah. streaming, it's streaming on Disney Plus. I have a 9-year-old so I have Disney Plus. Yeah. I can't wait to to watch I'll probably watch it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. To see it again. Good. But uh so um Hard Days Nights day amazing. Night, Hard day's, Hard day's night. night. Um, the you know, they have taken over the world at this point. Um, since you always want to work Kiss in, this is basically Kiss in '78. They they're untouchable. They're at the top yeah, of the top. You know what's hilarious? When Kiss made uh, Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park, that that it was sold to them by whoever came up with the idea as as Hard Day's Night meets Star Wars. And it's really like Scooby Doo meets um, <laughs> Scooby Doo uh, meets ass. Is what yeah. it's like. Scooby Doo just, meets a really un unscrubbed, a sweaty nasty, ass. sweaty ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's I, it, I have a bootleg version of that too, and it's fun to watch. But it is not fucking Hard Day's Night or Star no. Wars or anywhere nor, close. <laughs> nor will it ever be. I, I will admit that the Beatles were not my first favorite band. Kiss was absolutely my first favorite. When All Kiss right. Alive yeah. came out. Now yes. you're an official yeah. member of the Snags and Silky uh, inner yeah. circle. You're in the yeah. inner oh, circle, yeah. Alan. Uh, <laughs> but no, the, with with Kiss, and it's the last thing I'm going to say on them, those first six albums and the two live albums are are really a genre of themselves because they you – you can lump them into all oh, that's early heavy metal or something, but it, it was just good rock and roll. Oh, you know? yeah. good. played uh, by superheroes. Very you know, what, what else leather, do you need? Black leather, dirty street rock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Com comic book hero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. played yeah. by comic book yeah. heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, but anyways, uh, the, and so, uh, guess who their favorite band was? The Beatles. The Beatles. Beatles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is out, uh, the movie's out They're to You know, everything's just amazing. Um, they come out with uh, a non-album single, I Feel Fine, with uh, She's a Woman. And uh, again, just the songwriting. You, you go back to anything in 60, late 64, uh, that opening guitar of I Feel Fine, Oh, forget uh, about it. The, the where feedback. George puts his fingernail yeah. against yeah. the string to get that. Yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ! It, it's yeah. just fun to, the, you know, I, 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 I've mentioned on here a few times. I torture my coworkers singing. I can't sing, but I do. Doesn't stop me from singing. I sing along to music while I'm working, and it's a running joke at the office. You know, Craig's. Is there a stray cat stuck in the wall? What's? Oh no, it's oh, Craig Jesus. singing, and. <laughs> <laughs> There's no band more fun to sing along. I've got a nine hour Beatles playlist, just all the official release stuff and the singles. And there's no band more fun to sing along with. Than no, the fucking no. And Beatles. that's, that's what's funny is even the early Beatles yeah. is just so good because it captures that youth. Uh, for me, uh, five, six years old, I, I grew up in the seventies. So it was nothing to wake up and no one's in the house, but you. And you don't know when they're coming home. Um, you know, pretty tragic, but but music was always there. It was my my uh, my security blanket. And I would I had Elvis and the Beatles records uh, and and some Black Sabbath, actually, five, six years old. Those were the records that I just continuously poured through. And um, uh, the Beatles for sale. Uh, came out that December of '64, and there are um, there are uh, stories that I know of where uh, you know kid raiding the closet uh, right before Christmas and seeing a vinyl you know a record wrapped in wrapping paper and like this better be that new Beatles record you know <laughs> and tearing it open and you know playing the record and then putting it all back and taping it up. Um, I, I know somebody who, who relayed that story to me years ago, uh, and it was Beatles for sale. And so um, I, I think we should mention the first time we heard of the Beatles since you, you mentioned it. I've got a little bit of a story. Can yeah, I that's, drop that's kind of my Beatles thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. so, um, I was, uh, I lived 
my hippie mom lived in this duplex uh, in Atlanta near Little Five Points, which is like the the our our version of Greenwich Village, you know, where all the hippies lived. And <clears throat> this cat uh, named David moved in upstairs, about my age, five six years old. So we became friends. He lived with his mom, <clears throat> and his mom had a biker boyfriend named Tam. T A M. Tam. And, uh, Tam. He was a biker. Yeah. And I remember like he had a human skull above the fireplace in their, their apartment. And I remember like, hey, why? well, I was like, why do you have a skull? And he goes, cause kid, I dig skulls. <laughs> and that always stuck with me. Cause I dig skulls. I you dig know? skulls. So, yeah. Skulls, but, um, yeah. I, I remember yeah. we're in, we're in that apartment and, and David's like, you want to listen to some music? I'm like, sure. And he pulls out this album. And if, if I'm remembering correctly, it was let it be with the four of them on the, He's like, do you like the Beatles? And I had never, I had no, I never fuck, no idea. No what. clue. Yeah. I was like, oh uh, yeah, sure. And puts the Beatles on, and then you know, I discovered the Beatles. You know, but yeah, th- that was my first moment. I stumbled across them five or six years into this life. What about you, Alan? When did you first hear about the the second best band after Motorhead? <laughs> yeah, so, I was born in '66. And I remember hearing uh, Get Back when they released that single. I was three or four years old. It was 69, 70. And I had these older, like I have an older brother, but he was four or five years older than me. So he wasn't really into the Beatles either. He was, you know, he was born in 61. So again, we were just too young Uh, to get on the train at the time. But we had older female cousins that went through the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, So I remember visiting them and they showed me the Apple label with get back on the front Uh and don't let me down on the back. And I ate it up with a spoon. Get back. Get back. That's one of my favorite Beatles songs that fucking rocks. That rocks more than, you know, uh, when's their next album coming out? Uh, No, they they just broke up. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Just in time for you to get into them. Yeah. (laughs) No, but like, like you know, you mentioned "Don't Let Me Down," and you go back to, um, you know, they're 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 recording uh, the first album, and please please me, and they're like, look, we, you know, we're so close. If if you guys if you guys want to stay, we can get this last song done and wrap it up, you know. And John had uh, a sore throat; uh, he was dying. And he's like, all right, let's do this last song. So he does Twist and Shout, but just shreds it. And it fucking rocks. I, that it's, version it's, rocks. It's one of the most amazing yeah. vocal performances. One take. He yeah. shreds it. He was suffering uh, the, the book that uh, Bob Spitz, the Beatles, he talks about even almost a month after they did that take, his throat was... was oh, my God, know, wow. Like yeah. he tore some shit. And so yeah. you go forward to songs like Don't Let Me Down. Um, Helter even, Skelter. Even Mother, where he's just shredding. is so much emotion, so much. Yeah. Um, Paul, and, both of you. Paul's a great screamer, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so uh, yeah. To me, Beatles for Sale, that's, that's my favorite early Beatles album. Um, Kind of like with the doors, the first three albums, you've just heard so much, you've played them so much that you almost just like like the needle goes all the way across the record because there's no more grooves and stops on a song. Uh, for, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like the doors, where I my go to for the doors are the last three albums: uh, Soft Parade, Morrison Hotel, L.A. Woman is just LA untouchable. Woman. Yeah, untouchable. Mm-hmm. Um, but Beatles for Sale is really my favorite. But but I I love. There's not a Beatles song that I don't like apart from Revolution Number no. Nine. Uh, you know that eight and a half minute. Well, that's a John and Yoko experimental recap. thing. Really. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And that yeah, that's the one song. That is the one song. Yeah, and you know, that's they, the they, one song they would have been not they, be on the uh, part three playlist. They would have been the perfect band. I, th- I think that's I, I think I'm not even sure if I have that on my complete Be- Beatles play. I may have taken that off. 
they would have been the perfect band. But then there's that one song. See, there's, there's that, and there's there's only <laughs> there's there's only like, one other song by the Beatles that I you know I'll yeah. I'll allow it. I'll I'll never omit it. But I don't. I just don't like "Can't Buy Me Love." Really? Uh, what? That's yeah, a good I tune. just. I it it's fine, but I like everything else mm. far far more. That's you're, one I you're, just. You're the all, you're the one person. I think I, there are millions of people who agree about Revolution Number Nine. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I can listen to it. It's not a go to, but I yeah. don't. But I don't hate it. What I I will tell you, there is one Beatles song I can't. I I ranked all of them, you know, and on a spreadsheet. Right. And the one wait, wait, I, wait, wait, slow down and say that again. But I ranked all the Beatles songs, yeah, on a spreadsheet. On yeah. a spreadsheet. This, I'm this a is why we have this cat on the show, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. He's an obsessive and, nut Beatles fan. All right, keep and, going. And far none, the one at the very bottom is Hello, Goodbye. I cannot. Oh, wow, Good really? <laughs> Good job. I, now, now, when we get to that oh. album, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that Paul McCartney's first solo album. Um, because that's my take on uh magical mystery tour but um, yeah okay yeah so so uh to to cover what what i may not have mentioned um the beatles did uh quite a bit on bbc that's where the kids in england really lucked out versus the rest of the world that there were local uh british radio shows that the Beatles did religiously through the early sixties. And um, I did include on the playlist part one of the Beatles on the BBC, which you really get to hear them covering fifties um, uh, classics. Uh, they're almost live in the studio versions of some of their songs. It's just really different and a really cool way to hear them. Uh, the Beatles on the BBC. BBC there was yeah. also a fan club Christmas singles that uh, a lot of bands have not taken advantage of, but I think is really cool for the fans uh, to hear like a little, they get a, a little 45, uh, you know, some random cover that's exclusive to that, you know, uh, release. And it's a message from the guy saying, Hey, Merry Christmas and all that. Yeah. Um, pretty cool. Um, but they did that and then just, you know, playing on tour, uh, deafening, screaming kids, uh, just the, the chaos. And it had to be just uh, insane and so different to anything anyone had ever seen before. And that's that to me, that is why when somebody says they don't like the Beatles, they don't they don't understand what had been. Mm. And and what had changed after, you know, um, sure. to me, it's just, it's like saying you don't like the sun. You don't like sunlight. <laughs> right. I'm go, this, okay, this, well, you know. Do we really need this oxygen trees. stuff? I don't, oxygen you know. isn't necessary. Well, yeah, is yeah I, I don't like plant life. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking moron. I don't like oxygen. Yeah. No, um, yeah. Food is overrated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, so we're yeah, so we're like we're in the midst of Beatlemania, right? At this point, and I yeah, what I, I I think of two things when I think of Beatlemania is Ringo it had to be like it, the only reason they could play on stage. I mean, if he doesn't keep a beat, how are they even you know uh, doing? Well, you're anything? a musician, Alan. If if you yeah. watch, and I I don't know what show it is, but it's it's early Beatles footage. They're all playing, and Ringo is like hunched down. He's got the stick jammed in to the to the head of the drum, right at the 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 lip, and he's keeping the stick right there and just bashing the shit out of it. And his arm goes almost up back behind him and back down as he's keeping a beat with the other one. And to watch him play, you're just like, who the fuck plays like that? It, it's just he was a, a beast on yeah. the drum kit. And I just don't think Ringo really got yet almost like, um, like, like you could talk about Metallica and how huge they are. They come around, they're playing arenas. They are the most successful uh, band yep. right now. I just don't, I can't think of another band that's been around as long as they have. And they're still 
they'll, they're still relevant. They're still packing arenas and they're playing really good music. Right. But yeah, each, right. each yeah. individual member may not be fucking amazing, but you put them together and they're Metallica or you put them together and they're, they're the Beatles, you know, it, yep. it's these mm -hmm. moments. Uh, somehow they come together and it's like, holy shit, that's, you know, now my art, my argument though is Led Zeppelin. All four of those musicians were just, mm -hmm. they were, each of them were lucky to have the other ones, you know, they were, but, um, that's what are you going to say, Alan? Well, the, uh, I don't know. Did you guys see Beatles Anthology, that series? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I actually own that, but that's buried, okay. too. So. Right. I, I own it on Laserdisc, for God's sake. Nice. <laughs> Keep that. So, Keep that Laserdisc, because oh, yeah. that's... Oh, absolutely. Um, anyway, one, one of my favorite clips is from that era. On their first visit to, to, to America, after Ed Sullivan, they get on the train and they go down to the Washington Coliseum, whatever that place was at the time. And there's a clip of them playing. I, I saw her standing there. And just how you described Ringo playing, he looks like he's going to just fly. I yeah, mean, he yeah. just, vibrate right off the riser. Yeah, and... He's just an animal. It looks yeah. like a punk rock drummer. Yeah. You know, yeah. It like blows me away every time I look at that. Yeah, like are, are um, these people aware of what they're looking at or what they're no watching? no they're not yeah. um then you mentioned washington dc um yeah. it, they were they were still virtually unknown uh in the u.s i mean they th this may have been before the ed sullivan show but they they go down to your classic uh washington monument the mm -hmm. the that big open uh uh water uh pool you know, and, and uh, all the, um, all the dogwoods and bloom and stuff. And there's, there's uh, some really good, one of the books I have that's just called the Beatles um, probably picked it up around 1980 when John Lennon was, was uh, taken from us. Um, uh, but in that book, there's these just beautiful whole page color prints of them in that time. And it's just so, um, it's such a time capsule. It's it's just amazing to see them. They're so yeah. young, you know. Oh gosh, yeah, right. Twenty one, so, twenty two. Yeah, there's that, and then the other thing I, I I think of is in April of '64 they had the top five songs on the American Top Forty, which had never been done now, by I mean, anybody. I mean, and how, who's going to do that now? Other than maybe Taylor Swift, maybe, but I don't right. think. Right. Yeah. Not um, allowed to mention no. that name on this I'm podcast. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a valid point. She's the most yeah. popular thing yeah. out there right now. It's crazy. You can be popular and not be making good music, though. So, Oh, well, you know, she makes her. That's that's like a genre I don't even consider. So it doesn't. And right. she, sorry, I brought it up. Do what Ooh, she wants. Who? Yeah, like, what? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Paul McCartney has a book that came out recently, like this year, last 2023, maybe. Um, and it's, it's a photo book. Uh, and I wanted to mention that because it's, it's, uh, it's 19, okay. 1964 eyes of the storm and the photo, the front cover is just, them running down the street in the car is probably something from uh uh it, it could be from the back of a vehicle and these are people chasing the car but uh it's paul mccartney 1964 eyes of the storm and um you can get that on you know amazon wherever but uh it's it really is another time capsule of of this most amazing you just will never i don't think you'll ever have something like the beatles again you yeah know. yeah um, you know they, they were our mozart our beethoven you yeah know. i mean yeah. the, the thing wild. is it's it's yeah. short attention span now yeah, everybody's on yeah. youtube and all the other yeah. little apps as soon as something's popular they have to bastardize it and destroy it and and um you know, uh, yeah. this, this hawk to a girl, no one's ever going to hire her. She's, she might as well just go start porn now. Um, 
It's just society. They just chew these people up and spit oh, them out. And just, yeah. She, I, just, I actually saw an interview with her, uh, like a 15 minute interview on a podcast. Oh, I'm sure she, she's just a, she, she was, she was, she was working at a, a spring factory in Tennessee. And so she's quit that job. She's moving to LA to get rich and famous. So, Oh yeah. I'm sure she it. won't. That's fine. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm gonna, pills I'm gonna and put booze that, and probably an early death is what I'm predicting. But I'm gonna put that eyes. I, I I hope I hope not. You know, she seems like a sweet girl. But anyways, um, sure. uh, the Paul McCartney "Eyes of the Storm" thing. I'm gonna find that and link that as well. Yeah, that's uh, a good one, and and definitely that Beatles book. But um, oh for sure, yeah, that's our that's. On the list. Uh, that's the early Beatles. I, I want to thank you guys both for enduring my uh, rant through that. Um, the now Beatles, you're the one you're the one that gave this episode structure because you did all the homework. So we're yeah, you know, it's, it's, I tell you, yeah, your homework Alan, was impeccable. Yeah, thank and you, Alan sir. Alan contributed his natural Beatles knowledge, and I I I dropped in with the smart ass comments every now and then. So it's a good um, combination of. <laughs> what? To just the last thing with this is is the Beatles are just so crucial in in my you know uh, you know you got your your Sun Records stuff uh, and then Motorhead obviously and then the Beatles and the Stones those are all just like really uh, building blocks yeah. to my musical journey and. Um, you just always come back to the Beatles. Um, it, to your, it's to amazing. your point, talking about how we'll never have anything like them again. I remember in the late nineties, I was reading in Rolling Stone magazine, an interview with Mick Jagger and the guy interviewing it. Might, it might've been Jan winter was basically saying, you know, what was it like being the number two band back then? And, and Mick basically was kind of pausing and he goes, it's it's kind of hard to even consider yourself a number two to the Beatles because people, and this is in the late 90s, people these days have no idea how yeah. big they were. He said, yeah, you, that, it, he said it's like uh, it, it's like um, Jimmy Hoffa. You, you have no idea how powerful where, he was or where he is. Or well, where he is. <laughs> but I, but I, he said he said the closest you could come now is maybe Michael Jackson, but even that doesn't even come close. He says, yeah. You have no idea. People reading this interview are gonna have no idea how big they were. And yeah, sure, we were the number two band, but it's like being a little uh uh goldfish swimming next to a whale. You know, there's yeah. just it's never gonna happen again, and no, not it's like hard that. to fathom what what, what it was. No. I almost think it was uh, the planets in line. Um, Elvis was doing bullshit in Hollywood. Uh, Buddy Holly was dead. Uh, it, it just kind of opened, and there was this this vacuum. Right. And, and thank God the Beatles filled it. Um, and then you know, not not too long after they start popping off, uh, JFK gets popped off, and yeah, I, and I was they, just going to say that 1963. The, the, the November. country need, needed some optimism yeah. and people just latched on, you know, that happened, that happened in November of 63. Right. And in November of 63, uh, I want to say they put out, um, I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. Yeah. So. Right. And you that know, was their first number one in America. Yeah, with the Beatles came out in yeah. 63, November of 63. So so yeah. everyone's just like what the f you know and here's yeah. the Beatles to, to yeah. kinda... here's the Beatles to make you feel better. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Yeah. Um, the whole history every, of of Just go amazing. back to sleep America. We're going to get you all taken care of into Vietnam and and fucked up. So just <laughs> here's some Beatles stuff. Tied you here's over to Beatles. Until you get drafted and shot up. Yeah, in the we're going to ship you right the fuck <laughs> off. So you enjoy this album. Yeah, yeah you can bring uh, your Beatles cassettes with you. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, we, got, uh, we got Charles Manson on the pike. Everything's yeah, coming. We got it all lined yeah. up for you. <laughs> the listeners who have stuck with us are the cynical ones, I'm thinking, because if, oh. you're, if you're an optimist, you're not going to last long listening to this no, podcast. No, we're, we only speak the truth on this right, show. Right, right. 
anyways this is a good fucking episode this is the beatles the black and white years part one we're doing a three-part series the plan is the next two episodes part two the middle years part three the later years and uh until then uh keep it reals y'all yeah uh deuces to everybody say goodbye alan thank you everybody it was pleasure and honor thank you'll see us next week right Peace out.